I'm Martin. I'm Helen. I'm Sean. I'm Dave. And welcome back to the Other Worlds podcast. Today we're going to talk about something that's kind of related to a podcast we've um, we've already done, and that's the value of work that hasn't been published in traditional ways. So, by traditional ways, we mean things like um, paper and ink publishing. Uh, we mean traditional TV and film, that kind of thing. Um, Basically, there are those people who would say, and I'm sure that we've all run into them at some point, certainly as writers, who would say that something isn't proper writing unless it's been published. Yeah. What would you guys sort of say to that? doesn't really matter. Uh, for example, I, I do read a lot of fan fiction, and I've read several stories online that are of equal quality, if not better, to some actual books published through a traditional publishing house. So it doesn't really matter where you're publishing it. It depends on the quality of the writing of the of that whatever particular author that it is. Yeah, I must admit, I found that as well, especially with some of the more um, surprisingly popular books that have been published. And I think it's the reason they're popular is through not necessarily quality. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy them, but they weren't that good. They were books that, as a decree trained writer, if I'd taken them into uni as works or workshops, they'd have had red pen all over them. Mm -hmm. But I've also come across fan fiction, which is better than some of the novels I've read and some of my favourite novels. I've also, of course, come across the opposite on both sides. Yeah. I think it's all relative, to be entirely honest. It's uh, the value of workers and the reader, not in the writer. Uh, certainly not on the publisher. Um, the value of food is in how it tastes and it's going to taste different to whoever eats it. Personally, I do prefer uh, paper-bound books, but that's an aesthetic choice rather than anything else. It's mm. it, purely because they look nice and they feel nice in the hand. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a purely <clears throat> aesthetic choice, but it's not reflective of the writing itself. It's well, well, we'll return to, to books in a bit, because we've got a few examples that we yeah. want to talk about today. Um, and the first example that I thought was a good one to, to start with was poetry. Mm. Yeah. Now there are those people, and you certainly see it in things like GCSE. You know, when they when when people are studying GCSE English, uh, when you are study, even when you're studying at university level, there is this image that unless it's been published in print, it doesn't have value. Yeah. And my own argument to that was, you know, I remember hearing somebody say, well, what about adverts? What about those poems you see on the side of like bus shelters? Mm. Or uh, what about stand up? Uh, poets and performance poets. Uh, how would you guys react to that? Well, I mean, I personally find most modern written poetry remarkably pretentious. And the only poetry I've ever actually enjoyed recently, but isn't from Wilfred Owen or something, or uh, Robert Browning, is performance poetry. Mm. Because it's a performance. It's not just words on the page that I'm meant to sit there and analyse. It's, it's given to me. I don't have to work for what the hell it means. Mm. And I, must, I enjoy that a lot more. Maybe that speaks more of myself and the art, but... Well, I mean, you say you don't, you don't have want to work. work for it. I don't want to work for poetry. <laughs> That's what you want. You want it to be spoon I, I don't want to work for well, it. Well, hang on. There is, there is a point to be, to be picked up on there, and that is having to work for it. There are, unfortunately, the, uh, people that I've known, poets that I've known, who are performance poets but when it comes to writing down their work mm. they leave out essential things like for example punctuation and this yeah. is something that's always driven me kind of mad because without punctuation there is no clues for the reader about how to interpret the rhythm of that work, yeah. mm -hmm. the rhythm of that poem. That is how we gauge yeah. rhythm. That is how we gauge mm. meter yeah. through the, the, the construction language and through using all the tools in the toolbox. Um, and I think there is a valid point there that some some poets do make you work for it because they don't either they don't believe that punctuation is quite as important or because they're only really writing it down for themselves because yeah. they know how it's going to be read when they read it out. I can respect the second one mm. because it's very clearly more of a performance poet but I, with one where well, punctuation isn't important, we'll go back to uni please well, I'll go back to t learning please. well no because an absence of punctuation can be rather telling as well where you choose to put a comma can be as important as where you choose not to put one. Yeah, but having absolutely no punctuation whatsoever well, would lead to be basically, oh, you'd be tripping over your tongue. 
have you ever have view. you ever read Waiting for Godot? Yeah, there is an entire <laughs> stream of consciousness in that in that in that place. That's not the from a public works point. It's it's remarkable. And you stop it's where you run out of breath. It, basically. Yeah. Well, when you take Zathoth to be specific, at the <laughs> at the last in the red uh, no one before last we had uh, Jess Green performing. Oh, she's, oh, she's, she's a fantastic, absolutely magnificent, and her letter to Michael Go, <laughs> <laughs> which is phenomenal. Incidentally, um, I will put links both to Jess Green and to In the Red, uh, either uh, in the comments and probably on the screen somewhere. So, uh, for those of you who are watching, yeah, I was about to say In the Red, just like a Liverpool-based. Yeah. Um, Performance of your poetry, short fiction, etc. And it is slightly waving the flag for JMU, where yes. absolutely, absolutely. Where, 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 where I'm still, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, last one's the next few days, but her uh, letter to Michael Gove went viral through YouTube, and she's got a mm. YouTube tab where and then on to the Guardian, and yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's all about accessibility, mm. and the I, I never thought I'd say this because controversial statement. I'm not really the greatest poetry lover, um, but there is something wonderful about sitting there in good company and hearing this and seeing mm. it but at the same time I can get just as much out of reading it so it's just about accessibility I mean if you give me a felt tip pen I will write my novel on the side of a wall <laughs> Yeah. if people are going to write it I'll shave it into the back of my dog mm. so, so long as people read it it doesn't really matter as long as it is accessible which dog? You know which one. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one big enough for yeah, it. Yeah. So, depending on the length of yeah. the story. I mean, <laughs> what, what you seem to be saying, that, I mean, I would argue maybe not just read but consumed as well. Yeah. Because mm. uh, that's exactly what we're talking about here is things that aren't necessarily just traditionally published in a traditional way. Um, it is about how it's consumed, mm. you know, uh, how, it's, how it's accessed almost, as, yeah. uh, perhaps as you would say. Uh, uh, perhaps we should move on from from poetry then, because maybe that's not something we've got. No, I, I do know. I, I do know one thing. I, I think it's. I'm pretty certain it's in Japan in train stations and bus stops. They now have vending machines of yes. poetry and flash fiction. Oh, and that's yeah, spectacular. Now, yeah. wasn't wasn't that an exercise we ended up doing in first year, which was the 101 words short story? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. God, which was a really God. interesting concept, trying to. Push oh, down a story yeah. to just that little. Then they also gave us a five-word story. Yeah, that's not quite so easy. No, well, no. We, I do love them. But it's the happiest story you've ever written in four words. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a happy little sausage called Baldrick. Sorry, <laughs> that's a digression. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it was either that or we're gonna the get German guide by Richard Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't sue us, Mr. Curtis. We love your work. Most of it. Well, okay then. Let's let, let's let's move, move on. on then. Um, <laughs> from poetry to fan fiction. Yeah. Yes. And I think this is arguably a more contested area. Mm. I think those yes. people who are active in fan fiction would be a lot more uh, defensive of the medium, and yet there is this there is this interesting thing where fan fiction can certainly have more re readers than something that's been published in a traditional way yeah uh, I, I mean how would you guys respond to that well like, as you say it is more accessible because some people might not be able to make it out to the local bookshop or might not you know they might not be able to afford to go and buy each book that they want to read but on fan fiction it's, it's free on the internet as long as you've yeah. got a computer um, but I think not going to lie, that it's a very wide range of quality in fan fiction. Um, you do get absolute drivel sometimes, but you also, like in any medium, mm -hmm. you also get the abs absolute gems. But I think with fan fiction, a lot of people do focus more on, on the drivel mm. as a way to kind of downplay it. Yeah. Um, but if you take away the fact that one's published, one's not, you could give someone just print it out on a sheet of paper the story from a published book and give them a story from a piece of fan fiction and ask which one's published which one isn't mm. probably they won't be able to tell it provided they, they both adhere to the same standards of you know correct spelling and grammar and punctuation mm -hmm. and probably, beta readers yeah probably won't be able to tell um, depending on the quality and you might be able to give them a really rubbish printed book versus a really good fan fiction and they mm -hmm. will probably go for the fan fiction and say oh this one must be the printed one mm. because I think the idea that, that Helen's touching on is that in 
publishing, especially where you would assume, you would assume that with publishing, as in proper publishing houses, would lead to a better quality automatically because not they are professionals. Well, that's, that's exactly the point. Yeah, well, that's the shades of grey. But because you would assume, <laughs> yes, that's fan fiction. It yes, it is. It is indeed. Yeah. And it, it, it's worth noting that. I mean, there are those people who would out and out argue that. Even the no, even the novel that that was based on, you know, the, even the Twilight books that those books were based on were not particularly well written. So you certainly <laughs> you're certainly right in having in, in that point of there are the gems as well as the dross in every medium. Yeah. Do you think with the with the rise of the internet, fan fiction has become slightly more accepted or slightly more consumed than it ever has been before? Yeah. Yeah, I would argue that it's definitely more consumed. I also think um, there's a lot more of it than there is traditionally published um, stories because it's an access factor, which is kind of why you have such a wide berth and they do focus, and people who want to downplay it do focus on the drivel. In fairness, there is a lot to find. Mm. Yeah, but you have at the same time you've got to think about it this way: there are over three hundred and seventy-five hundred thousand mm. different stories on one website that I could find, and that's the last time I checked on one series alone. I'm not going to mention it in case. No, you, no, no. You, I'm sure you can guess. Mm. And yes, a good chunk of those are going to be mindless. Drivel, appropriately. <laughs> um, but there are a good chunk, thousands of wonderful stories that the only reason they are viewed as less legitimate is because they're not in a novel, in an mm-hmm. actual printed book. No, I think it's more a case of they're not original. I think it's the. I think so, this is the case where it's. I would argue, Sean, that there's a lot of books that aren't original, but they're still published anyway, and they're just rehashing the same story. Well, there are only seven stories, but I don't. Well, yeah. I, I don't mm. mean. I, I don't. I don't mean the same pattern, the same rhythm, the same you mean structure. The same I mean the yeah. same universe, the same characters. Um, of the, the exact same plot thread, but then again, J.J. Abrams just did exactly the same thing. That's yeah, besides the point. Um, it's looked down upon, rather unfairly it must be said because it's not an original conceit it's taking it's playing with somebody else's toys <laughs> now that's excellent practice but it's rather the same as always training for a marathon and never running one well mm. let, 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 let's pick up mm. on that a sec because my own view on this is poetry specifically the likes of open mics or poetry groups that exist and I know quite a number that exist in in the local area as well as fan fiction do provide an entry point into writing yeah, for some yeah. people it's a, it's a start point, it's a scratch pad and, and if nothing else I think we could all accept and agree or I'd hope so that there is a value in somebody actually sitting there and writes mm. now when the Writers' Forum pub used to publish books of poetry, the number of emails I would get with people who, who, were, who would tell me that they've got this great idea but never actually wrote anything, mm. my own opinion is that actually the person who's actually taken the time to sit down and write something yeah. is miles ahead of the person who has the million-pound idea but has never gotten off their backside to do yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know plenty of people to whom it is actually sort of therapeutic. It's a hobby. Yeah. It's like painting watercolours or... And I know personally from my own experience writing fan fiction, A, I've learnt a lot from doing it. Yeah. Mm. B, it's a way just to practice different characterizations, different voices. It's somewhere where, I, I should say, it's a sketch where you, you can practice <clears throat> your skill without having to then have a, having a published book out in the world that you're going to later look back on and think, why did I ever publish that? Because mm. it's, you know, compared to what you could do later. When Hunter S. Thompson decided he wanted to be a writer, he decided to train himself by getting the best book by his favourite author, which in this case was Great Gatsby. Because mm. mm. uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald was his favourite author. And he sat down and he copied it out, word by, by word, word, because he wanted to get a feel for how those sentences were structured. He wanted to get a feel for how it felt to write that, that book. book. And so, absolutely, it's uh, it staves off the cramp. It, uh, it keeps the muscles flexed. It's mm. so in that respect, yeah. it's absolutely wonderful. But like I say, it's like training for a marathon and never running it. Well, I mean, it's arguable. It's definitely good exercise. Mm-hmm. If if you are in a point where you can't 
quite structure the world that you're trying to build because that of course is the biggest difficulty for some writers yeah. is yeah. not the story but the world around the story mm. and going into play with as Bjorn so derogatory to refer to it somebody else's toys I didn't think that was derogatory it sounded derogatory mate but um, <laughs> well, anyway fine. I'm sorry yeah moving back on, on track back on track um it allows you that practice on developing things and from my own personal experience of building within that world that things have not been done before with a mm. frame and it helps me build certain elements that I will take into my original work yes so, so long as the original work is there then it's all good mm. Mm. I'm not talking down to it I'm just saying it's a, it's a means not an end it's a common it, it certainly is though a common criticism that occurs yeah what I think is perhaps interesting is certainly as uh, for us as writers is the acknowledgement of fan fiction as something that people consume something that people do read mm-hmm. in uh, Helen you were you were mentioned before we started recording the uh, the Kindle's Kindle Worlds program yeah Kindle Worlds launched a couple of years back now I think is basically on Amazon, they have purchased the licenses or the rights to several different universes, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Whether the TV series or books. Intellectual properties. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Vampire Diaries is one of them, for example. Um, and they've said that people can now publish their fan fiction and be paid for it um, only as long as it's part of one of those licenses, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, it's fairly successful. And there's one particular instance where the original author of the Vampire Diaries, mm. um, due to a contract that she signed way back in the 90s when she was first starting out with this kind of writing, um, she had the series took off her because it was a work for hire. And the publishers right. decided they didn't like the way she was taking the series anymore. Took it off her, gave it to a ghostwriter, kept her name on the books, um, and completely changed everything about it thing is one of Vampire Diaries is now one of the licenses on Kindle World so the author is now publishing her own version <laughs> of the books on Kindle World and getting paid for oh, it. Oh that's, that's, that's <clears throat> some comic justice. Yeah. It, do, it does seem to me there is there are some parallels here. I mean Sean you mentioned using somebody else's toys but is that... It, it was an analogy that came to mind. It is Got quite a, a fit but, on them, but the the same could be argued to be true of those who would choose to go into writing long running TV series. Um, there was the, there used to be this idea. I don't know whether it still is around or still exists of the spec script. Yeah, you would you would write your own script for a popular TV show mm. to show that you understood how to write characters that were already existing. Yeah, to, to show that you understood the world in which this TV show existed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if you are writing for a long-running soap or even any long-running TV show, there are things that you have to do. You do have to play with somebody else's creations. You do yeah. have to um, make your writing fit into that world uh, that this uh, that already exists. So there does seem to me to be some parallels. Absolutely. Certainly, absolutely, it's. Um it's only on the, the now much heatedly contested toy analogy is it's it, it's like when you're a child and you're playing you get out your action figures and you be, these be uh, from Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever else and you as a child you make little stories it's probably our first attempt at storytelling is mm. playing with our toys there's mm. nothing wrong with it in fact it's a very in, very important <laughs> part of our creative development I'll put you on your back foot there <laughs> Put you through the bloody window. So. <laughs> oh, that'd be oh, funny. No. That'd be good. That'd be a good one. The, uh, but it's it's uh, you're absolutely right. It's the definitely. You get the broad idea and then you start to play with it in your own way. It's um, like when <laughs> the hallowed name of J.J. Abrams got a hold of the Star Trek <laughs> franchise. <laughs> that, 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 one, that wonderful man. And personally, I don't think Lens Flair is used often enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a much underused and very niche aspect. Yeah. But you, to to inherit this... There, there, um, is, there is, though, an argument exactly there. I mean, J.J. Abrams was not creating anything new. No, that's what I mean. There he, is, he, he there inherited, is a, he got this box of toys. He says, OK, what will I make Spock do? What will I... And, and there is that rather cynical... Yeah. <laughs> there is though that rather cynical trend at the moment of the cash grab with 
with established series. You know, they're talking about, they've been talking about for years doing another reboot of Battlestar Galactica. They're talking about another Star Trek TV series. They're yeah. talking about using established um, properties, established intellectual properties in order to create something else. Mm. Nine times out of ten, we are, you know, it's, we didn't need, when they did The Amazing Spider-Man, we didn't need another Spider-Man origin story. And yeah. we, yeah. you know, if another, if another Spider-Man movie comes along, I think most people will have seen a, a Spider-Man yeah. mo movie and will know. If we get another Batman movie, we already know Batman's well, yeah. origin story. Well, we don't need thing. to see that again. I'm, I'm pushing my quarter century and I'm on to my third Batman franchise. <laughs> I'm, yeah. my, my life, you mean just in films? Because I can say you yeah. just a few. <laughs> no, no, just, just cinematic, purely cinematic. Ah, Sorry, see. purely cinematic. Ah, okay. Um, my life will be measured purely in Batman's. Yeah, there will be or Batman. There will be epochs of epochs, epochs. Anyway, there will be eras of particular Batman. <laughs> it's the same thing. They just get out the same toys and so. Please bring us something new, please, please. Which, uh, and I think please. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why you're looking at me. <laughs> I, I, I do think maybe we have we have come to that point of perhaps this is why. I mean, certainly there is. You you can browse any number of articles on the internet, all of which suggest that we should be looking for new and original ideas in our yeah. films, in our TV <laughs> shows, in our movies. Um, you know, perhaps that is an interesting point. Perhaps that is why we, why certain aspects of our society, look down on stories, TV shows, whatever it might be, created with established properties. Yeah. In terms, this does also tie into the last episode that we filmed, mm. really, where even though people are saying, you know, we want new stuff, we want originality, yet we do have these same. Franchises coming yeah, out well, over and over again, so it's you know. The thing is, there are no original ideas. No. Ult ultimately, everything is a not necessarily a rehash, but a different formation. Because in the same way, there are only so many colours. There's a very limited spectrum, and there are only so many molecules, only so many atoms in the universe. Yeah. You can arrange them to make new things. So you've got a series of building blocks. I can't get my head out of the toy box today. No, you can't. <laughs> you, you, but you arrange them into something new. So the component pieces are there, it's just move them around and I think this may be why people look down on different aspects of it, on different aspects of publishing because mm. it's not a rearrangement. Maybe it's a kind of subconscious um, um, aversion to the fact that there's this wonderful relatively new technology and we're not really doing anything with it. It, it, it seems a bit I wasted. Think that's, that's a it's bit fair in fairness because I, I remember there being a big, wonderful approach, but nearly every 20 years it appears, looking back in history, of 3D in movies. Yeah. Stereoscope. Yeah, we, it's, yeah. Not, it's not 3D, it's stereoscope. If you want something 3D, you go to the theatre. And by theatre, I mean, you know, a, a, a drama place. Stage. Sorry. Happy place. Happy place. It's stereoscope. It's always been stereoscope. He's an adult. He is the adult. But it's right. It's, it's, yeah. No, it's true. It's, it's, <laughs> but this is, this is what I mean, though. Yeah. Every time we bring out stereoscope, every 20 years, and we try to redo it, it's always. It's a new technology, which could be fascinating. But it's never used properly. It's always just. It, it might get a good film, and then they'll throw it at everything. But like, how many? Like, off the top of your head, how many stories are uploaded onto that, uh, onto fan fiction and, and similar websites on a daily basis? Top of head, ballpark Thou thousands. thousands. All right, and out of all this, ten thousand. We've got the full expanse of information technology. We've got the totality of human imagination. Let's dive in and see what we can find. Um. A gay sex scene between Harry and Draco. This godlike power, and that's what you're giving me. That's, that, that's all you. That's all you can come up with. Yeah, I must admit that. That's one of my own personal um, things I hate. But that will save for the fan fiction episode itself. But, yeah, that, that, that could be it. Maybe it's an aversion. Maybe because the same thing is happening with the. Um, recommended viewing on YouTube. It's like yeah, you, you've got this limitless creativity of the entire world on a single platform. Yeah. And, then and you're recommending me endless cat videos. Let's play on cats. Yeah, yeah. It's the so maybe and the yeah. same video over and over again as well. Yeah, I you've, found you've got this. You've got this wonderful technology, and it's not being utilised. You've got the the chance for humans to really let out their innate creativity and it's just kind of being either ignored or washed away in a swamp of 
that. It's the whole thing of Surgeon Store, really. It's 10% 10, 10 of any given media is going to be, you know, the best of the best. Yeah. The rest is, is going to be... The there is, I mean, on that point, though, technology has allowed us to do different things, and we... Uh, we can also now look at how how much freedom the internet has given us and how much freedom, certainly on the publicity side of things, the internet has given us for self-publishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, self-publishing has been a thing for quite a while. I mean, vanity publishing has been a thing for a long time. You know, in schools yeah. you would get those collections of kids doing poetry oh, and then yeah. all the... Yeah, and that's yeah. financed through yeah. the parents and their aunties and their uncles yeah, buying the book because little Johnny's in the book. And, you know, okay, perhaps that's a bit more... That's a bit cynical on my part. But self-publishing yeah. as well, has has I feel maybe come into its own yes. slightly mm. through this and one of the best examples I can think of of recent times is The Martian yeah. you know this is something that started off as a self-published piece of fiction that perhaps may not have got to where it is without the technological advancements yeah. that allow us to Absolutely, access yeah. things like fan fiction Actually, the interesting thing about the Martian is it rather um, nullifies my previous point because he. <laughs> oh, if, when, when I'm wrong, I'm happy to be wrong. It's because uh, he used a nowadays almost archaic form of publication, which was the serial. Mm. Mm. It, it, was, it was a chapter a month, I think. If that, was, that, that was roughly his it, it release schedule. It was released a chapter yeah. at a time, anyway. Yeah. So his. Um, Basically, following Dickens. Yeah, his, his release schedule was um, ultimately Dickensian. Mm. But on this new platform, so it's the blend of the old and the new. Maybe this is why people are drawn towards traditional publishing because they at least know how it works. But then, I mean, that that sort of serial publishing, if you like, is far more easy to attain through something like a blog. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, a post. Doesn't Andy Weir publish it through his blog? Isn't that um, how he? That, I, was, that was his original platform. I, I could be wrong, and actually, this is a very good time to mention uh, a great interview with Andy Weir, uh, Adam Savage, and. Uh, Chris Hadfield. Uh, I'll link it on, on screen for those watching and I will link it in the description. It is well, well worth your time to listen to. And he actually explains the entire process that ah, he went yeah. through. Um, which is, it, it's amazing that something can happen that way and it's one of those things that's mm. ni a, a nice little, it shows that it is still possible. Yeah. Of course yeah. we shouldn't all expect that level of success, but it's nice yeah. to know mm. it's at least possible. Mm. I must admit, I am, I, I am so slightly guilty of not looking down on um, self-published work because I would be a massive hypocrite, but depending on if, if the work's really good, I kind of come into it going, well, this might not be as good as I'm expecting, mm. which is a shame because it's normally wonderful. <clears throat> but, uh, well, normally the ones that make it are wonderful ones I hear about anyway. Uh, but there's one on uh, on my blog which is just, she keeps pushing crystal. I've never read it, mm. but I feel like I know more about it than I need to mm. Mm. without having read it and it's, I, I don't know, it kind of it puts me on the back foot going well and I know you want to get it published but why don't you just give me the links and let me read it myself Yeah. Mm. I, well, sorry, go I, I, I suppose the, the ultimate benefit of it the, the prime light of self-publishing is the immediacy of it mm. the artist now has a direct uh, by us, I mean, it could be writer, visual artist actor, yeah, yeah, yeah. singer mm -hmm. um, has an immediate connection with their audience, there is no middleman so and Andy Weir published The Martian on the recommendation of his readers. He only mm. continued, as far as I understand, I could be wrong, um, continued to publish it because more and more people were reading it. So mm. there is a an immediacy and a relationship, a more, <laughs> forgive the term, open relationship between the audience and the creator. I was thinking of that before, actually, because um, when we were talking about like getting people's feedback, and mm. I think with fan fiction, people can leave reviews and... That's how the writers can learn, and because f people will say to them directly, you know, I like this bit, I like this bit, but this bit maybe didn't work, or even it, something as daft as like, you know, you made, made a typo or something mm -hmm. like that. It's still all little bits that help. Whereas if you're traditionally published, yeah, you read reviews and that that are done by people who've bought it, but they're never really addressing the author as such. They're just making commentary on what they thought of the book. Mm -hmm. Whereas with fan fiction, it's a, it is a direct mm. um, communication between and reader and author. And, and you do with with fan fiction reviews, you get just as many negative as you do positive. Mm. Um, there is a slight bias towards certain ideas. If, if a fandom as a whole does not like the general premise you're going for, so if you've if you've made for uh, for Harry Potter, for example, if you've made Harry straight and it's not with Ginny or Hermione, it tends to come across a bit of flack. 
But that is a problem, I think, which is not just specific to fan fiction. Mm. It's more because you're writing in, in a niche rather than yeah. to the broad, or like, the mainstream. Yeah, but that's something that kind of puts well, it on the same level. I, I mean, we, we've talked about sort of online part, uh, things that are published online and what have you. There, re- there is still room, and we have in front of us here. Um, an example of one of the books, I used to review books for the Writers Forum a while back, and uh, for one reason or another I stopped uh, accepting review copies of books. But there's an, there's an interestingly uh, interesting example of a self-published one here, which is The Age of Not Believing. Mm. And I showed this to you guys all before we started, and it is one of the most beautifully illustrated, and, and it's actually a really well-written book. Um, and... There, are, there is still room for writers to create their work. Now, yeah. when I, again, you know, I used to publish collected works of poetry and what have you, and one of the things that I learned back then was that uh, in, tradi- in, in a traditional publishing structure, you have um, 70% of your cover price is generally, you know, anywhere between 50 and 70% of your cover price is going to the person who sells the book. Mm-hmm. Be that Waterstones, Amazon, local bookseller, whatever. Now, when you consider 70% is a lot of the cover price, yeah. which means the remaining 30% has to go to the distributor, the print costs, the publisher, the editor, and and maybe the agent of the of mm. the author. Any advertising. Any advertising. That's an awful lot of a share. So somebody who's self-publishing and is, you know... They may not sell as many units, but actually it's it's entirely possible that mm. if they're doing it right and they've got a big enough audience, they may make more money yeah. through that way. So yeah. for an author, there's certainly that possibility that it's it's worth more for them to do it that way. Especially if you're just beginning as well, because this is the, thing of the, the biggest thing I think with the writers who are so successful is because they've got such a large audience. Mm. So even if they're only earning, say... After all, the maybe ten percent of the cover price. I suspect it's more than that, but more or less, mm. I, I wouldn't know. But because it's such for, for such a quantity of readers who are buying the books, mm. you're not necessarily going to get that when you start. But actually, you're more than likely not. Um, and maybe that is a big plus for and uh, no. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um. Kind of like a, a leg up for your ego, uh, or at least your confidence. A, a boost, a boost. Thank you, a boost <laughs> to your confidence that you are able to publish these, and it's not just being lost because no one's reading it. The sheer size of the audience that is available now, do you think it's comforting or overwhelming? Because there is a, again, in any form of art in this new, uh, this, n- this new fangled digital age, um, a, a sort of a hand holding that you are going step by step and your audience is with you and probably you, after chapter one, you look behind it, it's slightly larger than it was before. So, because let's face it, in the traditional method of writing, what you do is you sit down in a quiet room with a computer or paper and you write and it's a very isolated uh, lonely experience so it's no wonder that we are on the verge of the the rock star writer <laughs> not me I'm more of a basement dwelling well, folk singer but. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean uh, sort of to move on slightly from that you do also get I mean, we could also look at the way that uh, TV has changed the way that we consume video based content yeah. so yeah you know, web TV and vlogs can be similar to yeah. what, what you were pointing out there, Sean. It's a case of it is more accessible. There is a large audience, but I, w- I would come back on that and say perhaps whilst the the overall size of the audience might be larger, I don't necessarily think that though that your audience for your particular piece of work is going to be larger. Mm. I think it's the same potential size either way. Yeah, it just depends how much well, advertising it gets. I mean, mm. if you if you don't advertise your work, less people will read it. Mm. Yes, a good few people may stumble across it, but... Well, this brings us back to the central point that we're discussing. If it does work that isn't quote-unquote published, does that have no worth? But surely it's just a case of who... that somebody reads it. A, a worthless piece of writing would be one that just festers in the bottom of a drawer. Mm. Even if just one person reads it, then it has value. doesn't matter how they read it. I mean, to look at and to look at then how these two, generally speaking, these two different types of publishing, for lack of a better word, um, can be separated. There, there are a couple of things we talked about before we began recording. And that's things like, in more traditional 
publishing formats, you have an editorial process. Mm. You have a novel, gets sent to an agent, an agent manages to sell it to a publisher. A publisher will probably use one of their in-house editors or maybe an out-of-house editor to go through the work and make adaptions so that it um, is a more tight piece of work. If you the, the editorial process is something that happens in pretty much every form of, of writing traditionally. Do you think there's some truth in the statement, though, that people presume that just because something has been published in a non-traditional way there's been no editorial process? I think a lot of people do. Mm. So well, if you're just sat at a computer on your own what, and you're not getting published officially, then where's the guarantee that you are being checked? And it does have you come in with the mindset of, this is going to be rubbish. Mm. And I don't think that's fair, to be quite frank, because I personally have two betas. <laughs> One of them is sat with us. But I don't let work go out unless I've had it thoroughly edited. And the assumption that I would do otherwise... It's kind of unf- it's got a, yeah. there's grounding for it, but it's yeah. a bit unfair. There, yeah. there, there is an assumption. I mean, when you're shopping around for agents, uh, which I'm still doing, and you read the the qualifications of their in-house editors, it's like, these are really, really well qualified people. They make you feel a bit inept. They make you feel mm. a bit um, mm. underqualified because they are they've got so many letters after their damn name, and they've studied here, there, and here's their entire CV. So it can be a bit daunting, and you think, oh well, they must be very good at what they're doing. Mm. Whereas the best we amateurs can manage is a red pen and maybe change our shirt. <laughs> so there is, there, 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 is, there is an assumption there because it, it, it comes down to, uh, well, as you were saying in the last vlog, the corporate image, mm. there is a an atmosphere, an ethos around it, oh, well, they look very professional. They, mm. But as, ultimately with writing, it comes down to the reader. I mean, I everything I write, I send out to people to read and occasionally they give me edits back so sometimes there is though that element now that's you know ever increasing of the self uh the the the, the creator as the editor i mean you mentioned vlogs they that that's a great example of how things are edited by the person who creates them. yeah you know even if it's even if it's somebody going through the footage of the vlog they've just recorded, even if it's all opinion, if they've taken the time to go through that footage and cut out a bit that might be too boring or might be irrelevant or might be where they've rambled, mm. that's still an editorial process mm. of, of some kind. Mm. You know, as far as this, this podcast goes, um, our editorial process is, is as simple as working out what our talking points are, what is our yeah. general subject, what, are the, what is the background here, you know, so yeah, yeah. we talk before the, before the recording about, you know, fan fiction moments, and that's where Helen mentioned uh, Kindle World, you also mentioned uh, Unbound. That was Sean. Uh, Sean, sorry. Um, you know, these things do come up. We do go mm. through the background process, and there may be, you know, I'm aware of podcasts where people don't do that. Yeah. They don't do any mm. kind of pre recording briefing, and that. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that's the best practice. All I'm saying is that you. To assume that there isn't an editorial process might be doing something a disservice. You know, yeah, when it yeah. comes to whether it be poetry, whether it be fan fiction, you know, if, if there is a performance poet there who is every time they read their poem in front of another audience they find something that doesn't work, if they change it for the next performance, that is an editorial process based yeah. on valuable feedback yeah. See, that even happens with stand-up comedy Yeah, oh, if of course joke if, work, if, if, a joke, if, if a joke fell flat the night before, we don't tell it the night after oh, yeah. And I playing s- on that as well, so I just, okay. uh, just um, that's the benefit, really, of self-published work, things like fan fiction, where if someone points out in a review that, oh, you've done this bit wrong, we can go back and we can just edit that in straight away and replace it with, with the chap with the correction. Mm. Whereas published publish books, they can't really do that. The, 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 there forever. Well, well, arguably, the, the same is true of e-books. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. you dropped. I suppose there's a question as to whether or not you can ever really edit yourself. Can you ever trust yourself to edit your your work to the point where it should be? There, Not there, to that point, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't either. There is uh, arguably, though, the point where... I, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I the number of times I would go through proofreading uh, an essay I was doing in university or 
even just proofreading my own poetry or my own script. I mean, scripts for me are the big ones. You know, when I'm writing a script, number of times I have to go through that and I will then hand it to somebody else and they will pick up something I have missed. Mm. Undoubtedly, there's a, there's a quote, I can't remember who it's from, but it was any book that's not got a mistake in it has had too much money spent on it. Mm. Mm. Because the fact <laughs> is... <laughs> the same, you know, six different pairs of eyes can look at one book and still, still miss all it. of them can miss one spelling error. Mm. Yeah, I know yeah. Uh, author Rick Riordan, who does the Percy Jackson series, has said he gives it first to his wife and his sons, then it goes to his editor, it comes back to him, he does the editor, goes, does the same thing about three or four times, if not more, and he still comes back, people will still message him after the book's really saying, oh, there's a typo on page, whatever, yeah. whatever, and he's like, yeah, I know. It is a, it is a blind yeah. spot. This is why things like Unbound are so interesting, because mm. it's... And the interesting thing about Unbound is it's for quote unquote traditionally published um, physical books, so it kind of comes around in a full circle, utilising the new technology that is available, because the audience is essentially voting and pitching in for what they want to read, and they get it, they see it point by point, so it creates a sort of collaborative in that respect, and that's a really interesting way to go forward, because it's sort of a middle ground between the two. Mm. Uh, I mean, look at what um, Stuart Ashen's managed to do. I mean, I don't know how long he was working on that, but he got the money and the support for it within under 48 hours, I think, of announcing it. Because it's, the audience was there. I mean, uh, I think that might be a good time to start wrapping. Cause I was going to say, yeah, yeah, we yeah. are we are unfortunately running low on time. So, um, <coughs> if you have been, thank you guys for watching. Uh, for now, though, I've been Martin. I've been Helen. I've been Sean. I've been Dave. Get to a tumbler. You should it. maybe keep it to yourself that you have tumbler. Mm. Yeah. It's the most sardonic laugh I've ever heard.